Chapter 1 Your Struggle with God You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20 verse 3 Do I love God unconditionally? One of the hottest issues in America today is the debate over values. Our values tell us what is right and wrong and drive us to certain actions. Your personal values can motivate you to donate to a food pantry or make you hide your income from the Internal Revenue Service at tax time. They can cause you to volunteer as a tutor or protect your own self-interests. It's not surprising that teachers, religious leaders, business people and politicians all agree that our values need to be clear. Where do you get your values? And how do you know which values are the right ones? Is it all a matter of personal choice? And if so, what are we to say about the values of Hitler, Stalin or followers of Al-Qaeda? They have values too. Values come from somewhere. And the first thing to grasp about the Ten Commandments is that they reflect the character of God. That's why there is so much controversy about displaying these commandments in public. Secularists object that these commandments are specifically tied to the God of the Bible. And of course they are absolutely right. A different God would have given different commandments. The God you worship will shape the values you hold. And the values you hold will shape the lifestyle that you choose. The common values that shaped the founding of America arose from a consensus about God. Take away that consensus about God and you lose any hope of consensus about values. It's not surprising that some people get upset about the phrase under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. If we really are one nation under God, that would mean some kind of commitment to live under the values that this God has given us, and that would mean a lifestyle that many people don't want. Those who choose a lifestyle that differs from the principles of the Ten Commandments need to find a different God, and that is precisely what's happening in our country. When the God of the Bible doesn't fit with where people want to go, they find themselves desperately looking for other gods who will reflect different values and therefore accommodate a different kind of lifestyle. A country that chooses to abort 40 million babies needs to find a different God. Our society is on a collision course with the God of the Bible who both gives life and says, You shall not murder. It's no surprise that the search is on in America for new gods who will reflect our choices. This attempted reshaping of God is not new. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When Satan tempted the first man and woman, he lured them away from the Lord by suggesting that God's commands were too restrictive. God had told the first man and woman not to touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan wanted them to make a different choice. His goal was to change how they behaved. His strategy was to undermine what they believed. Did God really say that you could not eat from the tree, he asked? See Genesis 3 verse 1. And this talk about death following sin is surely exaggerated. You shall not surely die. No, on the contrary, you shall be like God, you can be the Lord of your own life. You can decide your own values. You can discover what's right for you. See Genesis 3 verses 1 through 5. So Adam and Eve became confused about God. They put themselves in the place of God by grasping what God had not given. Adam and Eve's first struggle was their struggle with God. They wanted to take God's place. And although the first commandment had not been written at that time, it describes the greatest struggle not only of our first parents, but for all their descendants. Getting to know God by name I am the Lord your God, Exodus 20, verse 2. Throughout history, human beings have made repeated attempts to replace the God of the Bible by inventing other gods that reflected their values. The ancient gods of the Egyptians represented what was important to them. The Nile, the god Osiris, frogs, Hecht, and the sun, Ra. 
The Babylonians also valued the sun, Bel, but they also placed great importance on wisdom and literature, Nebo, and their city, Marduk. Each of these gods reflected the values of the culture in which they were created. In modern times, communism puts the state in the place of God, capitalism puts money in the place of God, and hedonism puts pleasure in the place of God. The world has become a marketplace for gods. So the question we have to answer is, what's unique about the God who gave the Ten Commandments? Why should we follow him? God introduced himself to Moses at Mount Sinai, also known as Horeb, when he spoke from the burning bush and commissioned Moses to speak to Pharaoh. Moses wanted to know God's name. That wasn't surprising. Egypt had its own gods, and if Moses said that God had sent him, Pharaoh would want to know which God he was talking about. So God said to Moses, I am who I am, Exodus 3 verse 14. In the original Hebrew, this was just one word with the letters Y-H-W-H. It's hard to be certain about how this was pronounced because the Hebrew text of the Old Testament was preserved without vowels. If you add vowels to Y-H-W-H, you could get Yehovah or in its anglicized form, Jehovah. Though most scholars today think that the name should be pronounced Yahweh. This is the name by which God made himself known to his own people. Whenever it is used in the Old Testament, it is translated as Lord with capital letters, and it is surely significant that when Moses brought the newly liberated slaves to Sinai, God used this special name to introduce himself, I am Yahweh, the Lord, your God. Literally translated, God was saying, I am the I am your God. He was saying, I've got a name. I'm not like a lump of clay that you can mould to your own liking. I am who I am. I am your God and I am inviting you into a personal relationship with me. The God of the Bible is who he is. That means he is not whoever you want him to be. He is neither a product of some ancient culture nor a reflection of the ideas of Moses. He is who he is. He is the creator and the sustainer of all things. He is the unchanging, self-existent God, and that means that he depends on nobody. He is neither helped by our faith nor hindered by our unbelief. God used the image of the bush that did not burn to make this clear to Moses. Fire can only be sustained as long as it has fuel. But this fire did not depend on the bush for its life. It went on burning, and the bush was not consumed. This is how God made himself known to Moses. He was saying, I don't depend on anything or anybody. I exist in the power of my own life. I am who I am. This sets Yahweh apart from everything else in the universe. Every created thing is dependent. Schools depend on students and teachers. Businesses depend on customers and manufacturers. Churches depend on believers and pastors. Human beings depend on food and air and water. But God depends on no one. He exists in the power of his own eternal life. He is God, whether we believe in him or not. Some folks love him, others hate him, but none of us can avoid him. He is who he is. So to make him your God is to come in line with reality. To resist him is utter folly. God's name sets him apart from all other gods. They were inventions of human history, the products of cultures that sustained them. Like pop stars who rise and fall with the fashion of the times, they rose and fell with the civilizations that shaped them. Nobody worships Bel, Marduk, Baal or Dagon today. They were designer gods made to fit the demands of a market that has now passed away. But Yahweh is who he is. He always has been and he always will be. He was not created by our words. He created us by his word, 
And that is why it is entirely right for him to say, You shall have no other gods before me.